There you go. So for percolation tinctures, you do need a couple of things. I'll show you equipment first. Um, I did show you, this is my um, perk cone. This is the first perk cone I ever made, and it's really cute. It is a wine bottle, just a wine bottle. I cut the bottom off, and then you want to sand. You can get that nice, fine sand, um, glass sandpaper, because you don't want sharp edges. You are going to be sticking your hand in there. Now, you want to make whatever bottle you use or cut, you want it to be wide enough that you can stick your hand in it because you need to be able to pack the cone, you need to be able to clean the cone. I found this once, this really beautiful blue bottle, it was a blue wine bottle, and I cut it and did all the work, and then I realized it was just a little too narrow for my hand. <laughs> so um, just, yeah, make sure you get a nice wide one. Um, uh, and if you are using a wine bottle, you will need some kind of caulk at the end. Some people get a needle valve, which you can find at hardware stores. Um, if you get a needle valve, you need some kind of stop cock. And so I, I'm using on mine, it's a ball valve. And I did find this at a homebrew store. And the ball valve actually came just like, let me show you, this. So it's just a little, um, a valve that has, you know, yeah, something like you might use for irrigation, but it's small. And then I bought separately, uh, this is a food grade silicon it's just a cork with a hole in it that also homebrew stores have that. So I, I have a local homebrew store, so I was able to walk in there and just bring my bottle and say, help me. Uh, kind of like girls do when you go to the hardware store, bring in your cart, help me. And they do. <laughs> Very familiar with that one myself. <laughs> okay. So um, there you go. So that's one version of it. And then what I did here, do you see this thing? This is called a clamp stand. This is, um, you can buy for, um, you know, chemists have this kind of thing. You can get various clamp stands. I ordered this online and it was not expensive, like 30 bucks. You can get clamp stands that have different types of attachments and grab, like sometimes they have the little clampy arms that adjust to whatever size bottle you're putting in there. It's nice to have a few different bottle sizes if you're depending on, you know, how progressed you get into percolation. If you start doing this for production and you want to do bigger ones. I have seen people cut half gallon size jugs to use as perk cones. So um, uh, you'll have to, you can play with that. And, and so it's good, it's very handy to have a lab clamp stand, um, but not necessary. So I'm gonna show you where most herbalists don't start here. Most herbalists start with something like this. Now I mentioned the Pellegrino bottle. San Pellegrino is the sparkling water bottle, which is a nice size. It has a wide diameter that you can stick your hand in and it has a screw top that you can use as your valve. So the valve is important because you wanna control your drip rate. So this is, I'll just show you, this was just a 32 ounce clear Boston round. Um, you probably like the tincture bottles that you're used to getting are called um, Boston rounds, but they're brown. You can get those Boston round bottles in different colors. Um, I just happen to have clear, and this is a 32 ounce um, quart size, which would be 100 milliliters. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 1,000 milliliters, roughly. Um, the nice thing about this is that it comes with a polypropylene cap which is pretty inert and resistant to most kinds of solvents and materials. Um, the Pellegrino bottles come with a aluminum cap and a lot of herbalists just use the aluminum cap. And what you do for your adjust your drip valve, like I have a ball valve on this one, uh, the drip valve, you would just adjust the screw and you get the drip rate you're looking for. Um, if you're using the Pellegrino bottle, I think after a certain number of uses, you do start to, the alcohol will degrade that aluminum. Uh, so I just, I'm a little caution there. Um, I have seen people find like a polypropylene cap that will fit those Pellegrino bottles. So you can swap out the aluminum one for something that's inert to chemical solvents like alcohol going through it. Um, then what you do is something like this. So this was, I, I just cut the bottom off and I sanded it and it's nice and wide. I like this one because I can get a lot of herb in there. Um, and then instead of this doesn't really fit, I could put this in my clamp stand, but if you don't have a clamp stand, this is what herbalists do. You get the ball jar, you get your cone pack, you pack the cone. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And then you'll set your cone 
in your jar and it's gonna drip into your jar. That works like your clamp stand. So this is the homemade herbalist percolation setup. It's probably been done, you know, home spun since the 70s. Michael Moore introduced this process to the herbal community and people have been widely using it since. You don't need fancy equipment. You just need to be able to cut a bottle that has a screw top and you can use a ball jar uh, for your drip, okay? I'm giving you options. I know it's overwhelming. Let me show you what I first, how to cut your bottle before I get into details of how to pack the cone and how the whole process runs. I got myself one of these things. You can order them online. It is a bottle cutter. <laughs> um, and you, I know a lot of herbalists say, oh, I don't cut my own bottles. I'm, I'm a DIY kind of girl. Um, you can go to a tile store if you are not comfortable cutting your own glass, you can take your bottle and take it to a place where they cut tiles and they'll use a tile saw. Or if you have a tile saw, you can say, cut my bottles and they will do it for you. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I live in a weird, weird community. I'm rural and you know, resources are not abundant. So, hey, you can get one of these on Amazon and set to your door. And it is a bottle cutter. And what it is, it has little wheelies on there. So, um, what it has is wheels and it has a little score. It's not actually gonna cut the glass, it just scores the glass, right? And you put that on there and you have to get very, it has instructions and tells you safety things where you just roll this around, you have to put pressure uh, and you score the glass all the way around in a circle. And then you'll take it out and then you'll do um, hot and cold alternating. So you get a bucket of like ice water and then a bucket of hot, hot water and you do 30 seconds in each and alternate and the temperature will cause the glass to crack right at the score mark. And then you can get that nice sandpaper, which will come in your kit by the way. If you get a bottle cutter kit, it'll come with a nice glass sandpaper and then you just sand those sharp edges so you're not cutting yourself. It's safe, totally safe, this is safe. Okay, so that's, um, that's just a, an example of the kind of equipment you'll need. Let me teach you how to perk. So I'm gonna set this aside. What we're gonna do today is we're starting with 100 grams of herb, which you all know is three ounces by weight, okay? We have here three ounces, 100 grams, roughly. I mean, splitting hairs between the two, but there is a slight difference. Meadow sweet. This is a uh, Philopendula omaria, and I did powder it. So um, this is, uh, I have to say, some people, when you buy meadow sweet on the market, you can buy just flowers or leaves and flowers. And I really prefer the leaf and flower together. The aerial parts minus the stem is really the preferred medicine. And you'll get more of those salicylate compounds. It smells better and it tastes better because a lot of those salicylates are in the leaf material. So that's just my tip on Meadow Sweet. Um, but what I did here is I just, uh, I got whole herb that I powdered myself and I just powdered it in my Vitamix. Very easy to do. Um, so you can see, na, 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 powdered, it's already powdered, that part wasn't hard. So the step of a percolation uh, tincture is first we need to pre-moisten the herb. And uh, ideally what you do is you pre-moisten the herb uh, the night before you do a percolation. The other, actually I should say this first, the cool thing about a percolation is you can make a tincture quickly. Right, your maceration tinctures take a couple of weeks. You can do a percolation tincture from start to finish in a couple of days. So that is another bonus. Um, but um, I'm not, I didn't pre-moisten this yesterday because I wanted to demo it for you now. So um, we're gonna kind of just crunch time and pretend this was all over a period of 24 hours, okay? <laughs> uh, but first, what you do um, uh, is you wanna pre-moisten your material with your alcohol solution. So I usually do all my math and gather my material before I start doing anything. Um, so here I know we're starting with 100 grams of herb. Let's just do a little quick math, um, like you know a normal maceration, which y'all know how to do. Um, if I have 100 grams of herb and I'm doing a one to five ratio with a 50% alcohol solution, Let's just start with how much total solution do I need if it's a one to five? If it's one part herb to five part solution and I have a hundred grams of herb, pretty easy. 
it's a 500 milliliters of solution, right? So that's what we're gonna shoot for. So we need 500 milliliters of solution is what you need to make a normal maceration. Now, when you're doing a perk, because we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have a certain amount of solution that's washing through the plant material, we're not gonna squeeze. This is one of the things that's different about a perk is like, you know, with a maceration tincture, you take that mark and you press it and you try to get every drop of liquid out. You do not do that with a perk. You don't touch the mark. So what you're gonna do is you're in your solution volume, you're going to account for loss of liquid in the mark that will just not be used. So what typically people do when you're do making a master, uh, percolation versus a maceration is you add, so you might do the one to five, so we know it's gonna be 500 milliliters of solution, but then you add the amount of the herb in volume of the solution. So let me say that in another way that makes more sense. So if I have uh, 100 grams of herb and I'm doing a one to five, I'm gonna lose about 100 milliliters of solution in the mark. So I'm gonna take my math and I'm gonna add an extra 100 milliliters of solution to account for that loss. Make a sensey? I'll review that again and I do have it written down in the notes. So basically you just do like you're doing your normal math one to five um, and then you're gonna account for the liquid loss in the tincture and add whatever the weight of the herb is, you're gonna add that in volume of solution to your one to five proportions. You maintain the one to five proportion is the ultimate point. Um, then, so separate from that, you're gonna need a little extra solution to pre-moisten the herb. So we've started with our powder and before we pack our cone, this needs to be moistened and it's, it's, what that happens in the moistening process is it starts to break down the constituents in the plant matrix. So I'm gonna say we're gonna, for this one to five, we're actually gonna mix up 600 milliliters of solution to account for the liquid loss. Then we're gonna mix up an extra bit of solution to pre-moisten the herb. So I know that's all complicated, let me just walk you through it. So we're gonna start with pre-moistening the herb. So I just mix up a little bit of solution. Um, this is a 50% um, alcohol, high proof alcohol, 95% with water. And I just mix it in a little beaker, which is nice because it has my little 100 milliliter mark. So this is probably more than I need to moisten my herb, but I have 100 grams. So I estimated about 100 milliliters of solution to, just to moisten it. So let me show you that moistening process. And before I do, I have to take off the Scottish wool because it's awfully warm in here now. It was not warm this morning when I left the house, let me tell you. Okay, here we go. So we're, um, what I'm gonna do is just slightly sprinkle. I'm just gonna pour, not, not the whole thing, I did like half of my solution onto my herb and I'm gonna just start mixing and I want it to get moist. So it's sort of like pre-digesting, breaking down, opening and softening the plant material and starting to kind of get everything loose, right? The grinding, first of all, when you powder an herb, you know, you're exposing all of the cells. You're cutting open the cell walls of the plant. You're exposing those constituents. And now when you add moisture to it, you're sort of softening and opening. It's, it, they call it blooming the plant material. We're gonna make it bloom. Okay, so um, I'm pre-mixing, I'm moistening, and I'm, there's a certain texture you're looking for. This is an important step. You don't just pre-moisten with any amount. Um, you moisten a little bit of time, but what you're looking for is called the consistency of sand, of wet sand. You know, have you ever gone, like, you know, if you have kids at home, and you go to the playground, or you have the sand pit in the backyard and when it gets rainy, you get a certain texture of what's in, or when you go to the beach and you're building sand castles, you want sand castle consistency. It's a real fine mark, okay? Um, so I am right now when you know it's kind of like almost there, you know you've got sand castle, <laughs> wet sand consistency, when you can make a ball and then that ball crumbles very easily. So I'm almost there. 
I think I need just a little bit more. Um, I did, it's close, but I want a little bit more. It should be break apart and be very fine. You see, it's still powdery. It's not like if it's too wet, it'll be like clumpy, muddy, soppy, right? We don't want it to be too dry. We don't want it to be too wet. Um, so you kind of get a feel for it after you've done it a few times. But the level of moisture in the plant material when you soak it will determine how well it packs in the cone and then will determine how well your solution moves through that plant material. If it's too wet and too saturated, the solution won't move through it. And if it's too dry, it'll start to create pockets and it'll rivel. Like you'll get a, a wet spot that'll river down one side of the perk cone, but then not the other side. And our ultimate goal is when we pack the cone, we want the solution to move through the plant material evenly. And there's a really great description. And if you ever read the uh, Medicine Maker's Handbook by James Green, he has a description in there, which is just awesome under percolations. And he says, you know, imagine like a, a, a soldier who's rolled a handmade cigarette, right? You roll it and you light it. It's not rolled evenly. You light it and you get like a run. So there's like one side of the cigarette burns, but not the other. And then imagine the tailor-made cigarette, you know, that's packed perfectly and evenly and you light it and it burns all the way around evenly down. So that's kind of the analogy that you're looking for with a percolation. Okay. So uh, here we are. I'm going to add just a little bit more solution. And I don't really, like I said, I estimated about 100 milliliters of solution to pre-moisten my 100 grams of powder. And I'm just gently sprinkling on and I, maybe I use all but 25 mils. I'm just adding a little bit at a time to feel for consistency. And I'm just going to mix and make sure your hands are clean because you want to use your hands to mix it so that you can feel for texture. The solution that you have for, that you just put in to dry the powder, the composition of that, is that like the one to five, just additional? It's, okay. it's just, uh, no, it's, it's, um, it's not a, it's additional solution separate from the amount that I've measured to do the, the percolation. It's just uh, extra, but it's pre, um, it's a pre-mixed solution by percentage. So it's a 50% alcohol water solution. So you make sure there is some alcohol, some water. You can adjust the percentage depending on the plant material that you're using, but um, it's, yeah, it's extra solution that's not, um, it's separate from the amount that I have measured to go through my one to five ratio. So I guess the, and the initial, yeah, sorry, and go ahead. the initial thing when you had the, you said, I've got to figure out an extra amount. So you picked a hundred milliliters of the solution. Is that because you had a hundred grams? Exactly. Whatever, exactly. So about, have a dirt, dirt, that's going to be the start of extra. Exactly. So whatever amount of herb I use by weight is the amount of herb I mix up for solution to just to pre-moisten the herb, which is separate from the amount of solution that I'm going to use to maintain my one to five ratio when I do my perk. Okay, yeah. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm, I'm just slowly adding it because it may not take the whole hundred milliliters, but I'm feeling it will. So I'm, I've mixed it really well. I'm still close. Like I've added maybe 75 mils out of my hundred to pre-moisten and it's almost there. You can see like it will make a ball, like a snowball, and then it will crumble, but I'm still feeling like it could use a little bit more moisture. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that last 20, 25 mils that I set aside. Just, I've been adding a little bit at a time. And, and then sometimes you even have to go over. So just, um, like I said, it's really by feel and consistency. Uh, I always just, like I said, start with the um, volume of solution that is equal to the weight of the plant material. And then if you need a little more, you can add a little more. Um, but now that I've added that full 100 mils of solution, it's feeling right. It's feeling like wet sand. Okay. Oh, it's feeling really good. And I just make sure it's really well mixed and everything's even. There's no dry pockets. I don't know, it's kind of like cooking. I have a friend who's, her grandmother taught her how to make homemade tortillas. You know, you can't follow a recipe for that. You have to do it by consistency. So this is really, you have to go by consistency. Okay, but there, it feels good. So now that I've pre-moistened my, my herb, ideally, 
I would have done this last night. And I would have let the pre-moistened herb, I'll put a lid over it. So I'll just pretend that I did, this is last night, right? <laughs> um, I pre-moistened my herb. Any kind of a lid will do. Just put something over it just to keep moisture from evaporating. So you want to keep it covered. You could put, you know, uh, a lid of a pot or plastic wrapper, whatever. Um, and keep that overnight just to keep, let it kind of sit. Like it's almost like it's a little bit of a maceration process by moistening and blooming those constituents. And then the next morning you come back and you pack your comb. And I will say you can do the, um, I've done this where you pre-moisten the herb in the morning and just let it sit all day and pack your cone at night or in the evening. But you, it's just a needs to pre-moisten for a few hours. I'd say a minimum of four hours, eight hours is ideal. Um, but anywhere in there is fine. I am gonna go ahead and just pack this right now, but we'll pretend it's the next day. It's still gonna be really good medicine. I'm actually not screwing this up. I want you to see that there is uh, fluidity and rigidity, but I want you to know the tradition is, yes, let it sit and bloom overnight, um, pre-soaked, then come pack your cone. Um, I have had cases where um, I let it sit overnight and then I go to check the consistency again in the morning and it has lost some moisture. So I'll have to sometimes add a little bit more back in just to get back to that wet sand consistency before I pack my comb. Okay, so this is feeling pretty good. Um, and I think I actually might just put a tiny splash more. It's as I sit and keep mixing it, it is getting a little bit drier. So I'm gonna just add a splash more. I'm gonna cream, this is straight alcohol. I'm just gonna mix up like another 25 mils of solution um, because just in the mixing, it's like the moisture is starting to clear. And I, I really wanna make sure my consistency is good before I pack. Let's do a little splash more. It's about so what do you think about doing this process versus a maceration that increases the time? Is it the gravity? It's because it's going to run through. Once it runs through, it's done. So as you'll see when I, I set it up, um, you're going to pack your cone. You pour solution over the top. You set your drip rate. And the drip rate should be, uh, it's a waltz. One, two, three. One, two, three. So on the count of three, you should see a drop. You have to get that drip rate just right. And when that drip rate, like how long does it take for one drip every count of three for all of your solution to move through. It usually moves through the, the cone in a 12 to 24 hour period, depending on how densely the cone was packed. And, and then also depending on if your drip rate changes, because sometimes as it goes by, like after three hours, you'll have to come back, your drip rate may shift. Like you might have it set to one, two, three, and then you come back two hours later and it's stuck. So you have to readjust the valve. Um, but basically once the solution moves through all the herb and you have a jar full of liquid and there's nothing in the cone, it's done. And that only takes a day. Is there a better, is, is, it, is it more efficacious or is there any value in doing it again? You know, like a double extraction kind of a thing? No, once yeah. you've perked, that's it. That's it, you don't, you don't run anything else through it. You've pulled out everything you can pull out. Now I have seen, there's actually, I should take that back. Cause if you go back and read, um, there's different percolation methods that'll be listed in the eclectic textbooks. And if you read Samuel, um, not Samuel, William Cook, um, he has some methods in there. Well, he'll say run an alcohol solution first and then do a wash with water afterwards. So I'm teaching you the very basic um, method of doing a percolation tincture today, but once you understand how to do the method I'm teaching you, you will be able to read William Cook and understand what he's saying when he says run, run this solution first. He'll sometimes say run brandy through it first and then run water through it and then add sugar and turn it into a syrup. Like you can get really fancy and it gets cool. Okay. Have you, uh, have you explained uh, the, the benefits of uh, percolation rather than a simple maceration. Have you talked about that? I, I did briefly, but if you want to give your spin on it, I'm sure it would be appreciated. I love it. Let's say you're all covered with dirt, right? You've been out and you're just totally dirty, been playing in the desert, you got dirt and dust all over you. And you come and take a bath, right? 
you're lying in the bathtub, and pretty soon the bath water's all dirty, and now you're not getting any more dirt off you because the bath water's all dirty, right? You're lying in dirty water, okay? Okay, what if you take a shower, right? The first water washes it away, and then the next one washes more away, the next one washes more away, right? So this isn't true for every single herb, but I'll give it that an herb it is true for is golden seal, hydrastis. Golden seal, let's just say it has two alkaloids, it has more than that, but it has berberine in there and hydrastine. Right? Many plants have berberine, but not many of them have hydrastine. And that's an alkaloid that gives golden seal some of its unique properties. Right? So if you do um, a maceration of golden seal, you just soak it in there, the solvent will take up a lot of berberine and then kind of all the soluble, all the parking places are now full of berberine. So it won't extract much hydrastine, right? You get the picture? So on the other hand, if I run it through a percolation, the first coming through takes the berberine off and then it's, it's berberine free and the next solvent takes the hydrastine off. And so you can, uh, some of, it isn't true for every herb, but for this one, you can measure the alkaloids in a maceration versus a percolation and the percolation has more constituency in it. Um, so uh, it's the principle of, of washing selectively. You're bringing off one layer, you know, the easily soluble, and then half an hour later, the uh, a little less easy soluble, all the way to the most hard soluble things are coming out of that. Um, so um, I haven't done it, this particular one myself, but at Michael Moore School in the, in the American Southwest, um, they would do a percolation, right? And they'd collect first hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour, fifth hour, sixth hour, like that. And you could go down and smell them. Okay. And there's some of the, they would have different odors because there's different things in, in the ones that are coming off, right? Um, so we did a project at the North American Institute of Medical Herbalism where uh, my uh, um, assistant and uh, co-worker there, Sherry Bumford, um, uh, we were, uh, we started a policy of making our own, uh, the, our own tinctures rather than buying them, uh, mostly for what we were using in our clinic. And uh, so she, uh, so we had a project three years long, we would take the same herb and macerate it and percolate it and then pass it around and sample it and have people say, you know what uh, you know which one's better and uh, what we found some of them it's distinctly it's like a different medicine right uh and if it's uh percolated and uh, we didn't have any where they were where they were better if they were macerated but we had somewhere there wasn't any difference right so uh anyway so that that's that's pretty much the overview on maceration versus percolation um i had uh i've over my career i've uh, and I think Heather's going in the same direction. Um, you, uh, you're supposed to, oh, you tincture it and you, you put it in there and you um, shake it twice a day, right? Your, your, your tincture, you're gonna shake it twice a day, morning and evening for two weeks in order to make your maceration. This sounds familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, okay. So um, uh, we were going to, uh, we uh, used to take students to rural Nicaragua to work in a medical, medical clinic there. And we used to have to bring all our medicines with us. So we have a fully stocked uh, herbal clinic there. And um, I had a task to make 90 tinctures, 90 pints of tinctures to bring to Nicaragua. And um, I uh, got, I was busy and busy and I said, oh my God, I passed the time. I haven't got two weeks to do it. All I have is eight days, right? And, uh, and not only that, I, not only that, I had to make them, press them and bottle them in those eight days. And I put my thinking cap on because I was a chemistry major in college, right? And in chemistry lab, if you wanted to get something to go into solution, you didn't just let it sit right you had to either stir it 
or heated. Right? Or both. The, they have these, yeah, or both. They have these little magnetic, they have a, a, a little uh, a magnetic spinner and you put a little magnetic stir in the bottom of your thing and turn it and it goes, right, and stirs and it'll make things go into solution. So I said, okay, well, how many times in two weeks, how many times do they shake it? Say, well, in two weeks, they shake it 28 times. Well, now, let's say I only have five days really to do this. So I'm going to shake them six times a day. <laughs> and I'm going to start them out with tap water, hot water, right? Rather than just any old water out of the tap. That way, at least give them a head start, right? Uh, and I did that in <laughs> this sort of the, <laughs> the culmination of my career after many, many years from scratch, I made 90 pints of tinctures. I took them to a clinic in Nicaragua. We put them on the shelf and we dispensed them all in formulas <laughs> to, uh, to more than 300 patients over four days while we were there. But um, that, that's the full cycle of herbalism. There. But that was the way this, quick, this idea, oh, I'll have to wait two weeks to get my tincture. You can, you can do it with a maceration in a few days. And the truth is, if you start your maceration with hot water, uh, uh, with hot water and alcohol, use hot water as part of the alcohol thing, you start it with that, keep it warm, shake it every couple of hours, you can have a functional tincture in 24 to 48 hours. It might not be your perfect, wonderful tincture, but if that's what you need, you can do it. And percolation is, uh, it's an overnight thing. You can have it overnight. You know. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It takes about two days for percolation completely because you want uh, one one day you want your herb to just sit and bloom, pre-moisten the herb, and you want that to sit. So that should sit for a few hours. And again, I've done it for as little as just let it sit for a couple of hours or up to overnight. And then once you pack your cone, it'll take another I don't know eight to twelve hours to run through. So yeah, roughly a day to two days. Um, so. I, I'm, I'm going to show you how to pack the cone is that the packing of the cone is everything when it comes to percolation. Everything. How the, the density, you know, if you pack it too tight, the solution can't move through. You pack it too loose and everything washes through too fast. So um, it, it, this is the strategic key to making a good percolation is how you pack. So I'm going to show you a couple of with two different bottles, I'm going to show you um, some packing techniques. Um, before you pack your herb in there, I'm going to go ahead and use this one for my demo because it's a bigger bottle. I'll say this one, which I love this perk cone and it has a nice little valve on it. It doesn't hold the whole volume of my solution. When I pack uh, 100 grams of herb in here, I can only have room for about, you know, uh, 200 milliliters of solution at a time. So then I have to come back and keep adding my solution, which works. Um, but for most of you at home, if you're starting perks, I recommend just getting some kind of a bottle with a cap. Um, and this is so, I'll be demoing with something that you might be familiar to a beginner. Um, so before you pack, you have to take the cap off because as you pack, you want to make sure air can escape. So lid off. And yeah, I wanted to say, say one more thing. Um, the new fluid you put on there, it isn't just draining through. You, there's a column of water there, and the stuff at the top pushes the stuff beneath it. It's a hyd hydrologic pressure. It, it's like like pushing it through. It isn't just all just kind of drizzling through. Right, right. right. Exactly. That's why you need good uh, uh, air suction, right? That's part of taking the cap off there. Um, the other thing you're going to want to do is you have to do something to prevent your herb from falling through. Because if I just packed my cone, herb would start pop pouring right out my cone. So there's various ways that people have figured out to keep your herb in your bottle. Um, one is, I, I you saw me cutting up a coffee filter. These are um, coffee filters, unbleached ones that you would use for like a coffee maker. Um, and I have learned, so you see various people do various techniques. I'll show you some things I've seen. You can just take the whole thing and you could fit it in there. Now, problem with that, I'll tell you there's, there's problems with this. Um, if you get it wet, like you can, so maybe I'll just go ahead and get it wet. I have some water right here. Let's pour a little splash into my thing. So if you get it wet, you can kind of make your coffee filter fit up the sides. I'll, I'll show you the reason this is problematic and why I don't do it. 
Um, so you get your coffee filter wet. Now, okay, I could very carefully try to get it to go into my cone to block the bottom. And like that. But then you have this like, some parts stick, some parts don't. You have pockets that stick out. Like you could spend hours fiddling with it. And then when you go to pack your herb, the herb's gonna move the coffee filter. And it's, you can see in there how it's like, that's not gonna really help me when I go to pack my cone, it's challenging. Um, I have learned that with a snub, now this bottle has a short nose. So you could just stuff the neck, but mm, it's not enough. So what I did was I took my coffee filter and I cut a circle. I just cut the inner part out. And now if I just get that a little bit wet, just kind of uh, I moisten the paper, it should stick lay flat right across the bottom without crawling up the sides of the cylinder. It's when the paper goes up the sides that you have the most issue with packing your cone. So if I, for this one, this is what works best for this particular cone, is if I cut a circle out. I, I've also seen people where some people like fold their paper um, to make it lay in there, but then you still have to deal with corners and things. So I just, you know, the size of the cone, you can cut your paper down smaller to really fit the size of your cone. And if it's moist, it helps to stick to the edges of the bottle. And then when you pack your herb in there, you're not getting herb in between the bottle and the paper. You want it all to be on top of the paper. So you can see how that actually works really, really well. It's just a liner barrier to prevent herb from falling out. Now, if I'm going to use something that has a long neck, like if you're gonna use one of those Pellegrino bottles, um, here's a wine bottle example. What I have learned to do is just stuff something up in the neck. You could get a moist cotton ball, stuff the neck. That's one way. If all you have is these paper filters, you could basically get a wet paper filter, kind of ball it up there, right? Wrap it around my finger, make sure it's closed in the middle. And now I have something that I could literally just stuff up the neck like that. So if I'm using something with a long neck, I'll do that technique, um, but this one has a short neck. So uh, I'm just using the paper barrier method. Okay, cap off, paper down. Now, we're gonna pack the cone. This is where you want to do your best to think of dividing your plant material into three parts. So we're gonna do what's called the papa, the mama, and the baby pack. So three stages. So I'm gonna kinda just eyeball with my hands what looks to be about a third of my my pre-moistened plant material, which we're gonna imagine actually sat here for a few hours. And I'm gonna stick it in my jar carefully with my hand. And it's not quite a third, I'm gonna put a little bit more in there. And um, I've got, yeah, that's, let's see, maybe a little bit more, is it more close to a third? There we go. It's about a third of what I've got in my bowl. And then I am going to carefully um, pack this, this is the baby pack. The first third, you pack the lightest. Be and you, I, what I do is I use the back of my fingers and I come down and just tamp, like a tamp. Um, I know some people will use, you could do something like the bottom of a beaker and start tamping with that. The problem is if you're using a tool to tamp, you can't feel the consistency of how tightly you're packing. And people tend to overpack when they use another device like the bottom of a jar. So I recommend you use your hands because then you can feel the tension and how tight you're packing. So you want to kind of make it flat. So first of all, I'm knocking around the plant material so it's got a flat surface. I'm working my fingers around the edge so that it's not coming up the sides. It's all flat. And I'm just lightly, very lightly, as light as I can possibly do it, making this herb tamp into place. And the reason why I'm doing the first level light is because when I do the next level, it's gonna pack the bottom level down. So then the, so the first one's the lightest, the second one's medium, and then when you put the third one in, you pack just a little bit high, harder, that's the pop pack, and that kind of squishes everything into a very nice, um, uh, I'm not sure what you use, there's the word like, anyone here a barista? You know, like baristas have learned how to pack the coffee espresso just right. You know, there's like a 
so many degrees of pressure you're supposed to add. So you kind of think of that half the pressure level uh, when you're packing your cone. Okay, so that is a very light tamp pack and it's just the first third of my plant material. It's about as flat as I can get it. And I got a little bit of a glare on there, but you can see. Um, and now I'm gonna do my next level. So the second level. Here, I'm gonna to just kind of sprinkle the herb in. Yes, dear. On the first pack, if you were to kind of jiggle that bottle, should it still be moving a little bit or should it be? It's gonna okay. be wet so it won't jiggle. Okay. Right, if it was loose dry powder, sure, it would be flying all over the place, but because there's water, it's kind of prevented. You'll get little tiny peaks where your fingers were in there. That's okay, flatten them out as best as you can with your hand. Um, you, I mean, I what I do is if you're gonna jiggle it, I jiggle it before I tamp it. So you can see how there's a peak in there right now. And if I jiggle it here, I will get it to kind of level out. But then I still have to tamp it with my hand to get that pressure. So now I'm gonna come in and just slightly more pressure. And I, what I do, I'm gonna come around so you can kind of see my fingers a little better. Mm. You see how I like press my fingers against the edge of the glass and I'm just tamping around the edge and I'm going in a little mini circle, all turning the glass and just tapping the edges so I have a nice even edge. And then it's very easy to tamp the center but getting those edges nice and tight so that it doesn't run. Because if you don't have your edges as evenly packed as the center, then you'll get those runs where the alcohol will just kind of pool one side and then you have dry pockets, which we want to prevent. Okay, so just kind of going. Now let's say you do the first, second, and third, and then maybe you screwed it up. <laughs> And then you put your liquid in and you see that you have like these fissures or these pockets. It, can that be corrected or it's kind of like this is what it's going to be? If you screw up the perk, just dump it into a jar and macerate it. Right? Nice. It happens all the time where like, oh, the perk, I didn't pack it quite right and the liquid got stuck. Nothing will move or you've got the river going down one side, there's really no way that you, you can't pull it out and repack it. Once you've got solution in there, you are, you gotta go with what you got. You're just, fingers crossed, you packed it right the first time. There's no correcting it. But if you screw it up, no big deal. Just dump it into a jar, macerate it. You can still save your plant material. It's not a waste. For the, for the second pack, are you doing another like third? Yes, so it's third, so you're gonna do, pack your cone in thirds. The first third, the lightest. The second third, a hair more pressure, not a lot. The third pack, a hair more pressure. But it's actually easy to overpack, and then you don't have any movement in your solution. What's gonna, what's gonna prevent things from moving too fast through your cone is the drip rate. So that's, that's the, the big key there is that the, the pack is wants to be so that movement can happen and solutions moving evenly through the plant material, but then we're gonna control how fast it goes by the valve. Okay. Now that the top layer in there, I can kind of jiggle that top layer so it's sort of level. Now I'm going around with my fingers. And this is a very nice bottle to use, this quart size uh, um, clear bottle. That's a, basically a, you know, you know, like a tincture bottle, but really big and clear. Um, because it's so wide and I have lots of room to get my hand in there, um, that's, I really do like this bottle, it perks well. Uh, lots of room to get my hand in there and it has lots of room for solution on top. And I have, like I said, I've seen people take half gallon or even gallon sized jugs and use them to make perks. Um, if you're doing a large volume, you know, doing like production, uh, like for an herb shop. I've also seen, who is it oh, that does the, 
He has like a whole percolation station. Um, Sam Kaufman, you know, heard of Sam Kaufman. He runs a school in Texas, um, Human Path really brilliant medicine maker. Um, he has this, he built a percolation set up like a, it's like a wooden stand that he created where he could line up like eight bottles. So you can run eight perks at once. Um, so you can, you can get fancy with it. Just letting you know the sky's the limit once you start getting familiar with the basic process. All right, so I think my cone was packed. Now this is gonna be the moment of truth where we see if how well I packed it. <laughs> um, there's always a risk that I'm doing this demo and I'm gonna screw up. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, remember the cap was off. I've got a nice barrier, something to keep the herb in there. And now I need to put a barrier on top because if I start just pouring solution on top of my herb, it's gonna create a divot, right? Like if I just pour in there, it's gonna create pockets and I'm gonna create pooling. So you need something to pour off of or over that won't um, create any ripples in your pack. You don't want to disturb your pack, right? So there's a couple techniques that people do for this. One is I simply just take another piece of paper and put it on top. So I, I could take this uh, another coffee filter here and place it on top. I'm going to cut it into a circle. The other thing I do, I actually do, I'll do both. Um, I'll put another layer of paper on top, and then um, I actually forgot to grab a rock from outside, but you can get a, a rock that you've cleaned, like just get a rock from outside, wash it, and place the rock on top so that when you pour your solution, you pour onto the rock, and then the solution drips around it evenly and soaks in. So that's another technique. And I, of course, if you're gonna be a cool herbalist, people like to use crystals and stuff. You know, you get your favorite like rose quartz or something, and then you're adding a little mojo or whatever. I'm, I, I tend to not care about my rocks so much. I'm not a crystal person. I, I know I seem like I would be the crystal person, but I'm not. Um, I kind of think, you know, those mineral deposits should be in the ground. <laughs> we, we do a lot of destruction to the earth just so we can take pretty shiny things out of the ground. I'll never be the person buying a diamond. That's not me. Okay, so I'm just gonna do my paper because yeah, paper is rad. Um, so cutting my circle out again so it'll fit the top. So I've got two basic barriers. I've got a top and a bottom, and I will just moisten this a little bit. I'm just gonna stick this in the water there so that it lays nice and flat. And it's not popping up on me. A little wet circle. It's not a perfect circle, but there it is. And I'm just making my top barrier. Okay. All right, so there's that. Now, I honestly, I, I sometimes, I don't even do the rock. Like as long as you got a paper barrier on there, that is dispersing the liquid. So you're not gonna create pockets. If you need extra protection, you can do that. Um, I could even just take like a lid, because that's something I have. I could take like a lid, place it on top and pour off of that, right? So just any kind of a hard, flat surface. Uh, a flat river rock is really kind of ideal if you're doing that. See, I got extra lids here, so maybe I'll just grab one of those. I have, let's see, this is an extra cap. So 32 ounce cap, just a little plastic doodad, inert polypropylene cap. Okay. Alrighty, so now you can see I got my cone perfectly packed. Hopefully, hopefully I've got it packed. We'll see how perfect we'll find out in a minute. Now we're gonna do our math on our solution. Let's just remember, what are we doing for solution again? We have 100 grams of herb in here. We're gonna do a one to five. We gotta add a little bit extra solution to account for the amount of herb that's in here that's gonna get lost, the mark, the solution's gonna get lost in the mark. And then we wanna make it a 50%. There's a few, a few things we wanna figure out before we start pouring, right? So first things first, uh, we know a one to five, we're gonna need 500 mils of solution. There's 100 grams in here, so we wanna add an extra 100 mils of solution. So now we want 600 mils of solution. And we want our 600 mils of solution to be 50% alcohol. That's not hard. So I have here 95% alcohol. We're just gonna you know, do the math 
pretend it's 100. That's what people do. I'm not making it up. I am going to use my measuring cup, which has milliliter measurements. And I'm gonna pour 300 mils of alcohol and 300 mils of water and pre-mix my solution before I start pouring. So here we go. Alcohol first, 300 mils. Okay. And water next. Here's my water. 300, oh, this only goes up to 500 mils. Oh, shoot. Deep, 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 deep. I'm gonna have to get a bigger thing. Oh my God. This is what, 40%, 95% alcohol? Um, I'm start, I'm, we're, I am doing what's a 50% alcohol solution. So it's for me to make a 50% solution, I'm starting with 95% alcohol and diluting it with water. 50-50. Now, if you are in a country where you cannot get 95% alcohol, you can do your percolation with 40% vodka. It will be fine. It will actually still be good. And if you go back and look at some of the physiomedicalists, like William Cook, he did percolations with brandy. 40% alcohol will work just fine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, let me see. I'm gonna pour this in here. Maybe I should stop teaching people how to use 95% alcohol. It is a modern American thing to do, just to be honest. If you go around and you see all the modern medicine maker or herbalists out there, they're always saying, higher proof alcohol, better. Remember the higher the proof alcohol, the less you taste the herb. We're not just trying to go for alkaloids. And I think that when you just go high alcohol, it's like you're trying to get more scientific. You're trying to prove, oh, it's the constituents. It's like you're basing your medicine, making your medicine experience on a study that was published in the Journal of Medicine that was based on some laboratory study, had nothing to do with clinical experience and what happens when you put an herb in a human body. So I wanna go back and just remind her that taste, flavor, energetics has a lot more weight in how your herbs work in a person than trying to extract alkaloids. So I, I'm teaching you this method because it is what's the standard in North American herbalism. I don't know if it's like this in all over the world, but I do know in British herbalism, which I have more familiarity with outside of the US, they do everything in 40% or like 20 or 30% alcohol and you can taste the herbs and it's not all about the alkaloids. There's a lot more in there. So I'm just saying that and then here I am being an American again. So apologize for my isms. Okay, so I got 300 mils alcohol. I did the alcohol. We're doing water now. Water, 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 Six up to 600 mils. Oh, I just barely enough there. It's good, okay. So I'm doing 50% alcohol. Remember, that's not too far from 50% alcohol. I mean, for 40%. So if you're doing 40%, you're just fine. You're fine. Do people know what proof is? Proof is half the percentage. No, double. Yes, the proof is double the percentage. Proof, proof is you can get give somebody some. Uh, Selling somebody some whiskey, and you want to know how much alcohol is in there. This is in the old days, right? You get a little pile of gunpowder and put a little bit of the whiskey on the gunpowder, and if that was a, if that was enough to light the gunpowder, that was proof that there was alcohol in there. And so it was about fifty percent alcohol will ignite gunpowder, right? So that's why a hundred proof liquor is fifty percent alcohol. There you go. Eighty percent is forty, and so on. I just can't, you can't pass that up. I mean, you can, you can see the explosion, right? The flash and the sparks, and you can hear the boom. You go, oh, that's the good stuff, man. Let's go party. We got to try that now in class. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, moment of truth. Here, we're going to start pouring. Um, I'm actually going to take the cap off just to show you. It won't really do a whole lot of divoting. Some people do the, the cap, I mean, the rock in place of the paper. I really think the paper does it just fine. You just pour slowly and carefully. So what I'm gonna do is pour, I'm not gonna pour all my solution just yet. Um, and then I am gonna watch, oh, it's already moving through beautifully. 
it's moving through a little bit faster at one side or the other, but it is coming through. And I don't know if you can see, but my solution is coming through. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna pour just enough solution through to make sure everything is moist. So I'm gonna pour some more. It's like gone halfway through the plant material, keeping the lid off. My lid is still off because if I put my lid on, I would stop the flow, right? It's that vacuum that we're creating. So I'm pouring just a little bit more and uh, what we're gonna do is this process called digestion. And digestion is where you've poured just enough solution that basically the solution has moved through the plant material. You start to see one or two drips and then you cap it. Um, and you're gonna let it digest for several hours before you let it drip. So um, almost to the bottom, it hasn't dripped yet, but it is getting moist all the way through. I see the, I did a good job on my pack because it, the, Solution is moving through the plant material at an even rate. And so I didn't screw it up. Hallelujah. Um, sometimes it's no fault of the packer. It just happens depending on the plant material. So they know to look for channels. Exactly. And I just saw oh, my first drip. So once you get a drip, you cap and stop it. Don't let it run through. So this means now the cool. liquid has moved through, everything is saturated, I cap it tight, stop the drip. And this is digestion, you let sit for, usually eight hours is the standard, where you just let it sit and you do nothing, you just let it digest. I cheat, sometimes I'll only let it digest for a couple of hours, it still works, you still get excellent quality medicine. So anywhere from you know, a couple of hours to overnight is fine. Um, so if you really think about the whole process, if you're gonna do like, I actually say percolation takes three days if you're gonna do the whole process properly. First, you're gonna pre-moisten your herb, you're gonna let that sit overnight. The next day, you're gonna pack your cone, you're gonna pour solution to the point of digestion, you're gonna cap it, you're gonna let that sit all day or overnight. And then you're gonna pour the solution, you're gonna set your drip rate, and it'll take another roughly eight to 12 hours for it to run through. So those are three separate like eight hour periods, which I don't know, I guess you could condense them all and do it in 24 hours if you're up all night, <laughs> if you're watching it. <laughs> okay, so there it is, that's digestion. And one of the things I do, like like I said, I'll, I might set up an herb and do the pre-moistening in the morning one day, pre-moisten my herb, that at the end of the day, I'll pack my cone and get the solution in there and let it digest and let it sit overnight. And then the next morning, I'll pour my solution and do the drip rate. So in that case, it's, you can do it in two days very quickly and with all the length of time. And then you can, in all honesty, shorten the hours of the, the pre-soaking the bloom period and shorten the hours of the digestion period. Um, and you can do it more quickly. I don't know that there is really a big benefit to sit, letting one sit longer than the other. Um, I honestly have been doing demos like this where I squish it all into a two hour period and the medicine comes out phenomenal. So I'm not really worried about how this is gonna come out. Okay. So uh, at this point, what we will do is we will pretend that this has been sitting for eight hours digesting or at least two hours, right? Minimum of two hours digesting. So now I am going to pour more solution in there and I'm gonna set my drip rate. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna- Did you just cheat the lid to make sure it was tight or did you just loosen it? Just I just tightened it because I'm gonna pour solution in there. I'm gonna fill it with solution and then I'm gonna set the drip rate. Um, and one of the things you'll notice if you are doing this method, this is actually another trick I should help you understand. Um, if you're doing this method where you have a glass bottle sitting on top of a jar, you get this kind of loosey goosey movement. There's a couple of tricks to kind of help create stability so it's not slopping and sloshing on you because once you've got solution in there, if you get it tipping to one side, you're bound to create some rivers, right? So there's some tricks. Let me show you a couple options. Um, one is the ring of your ball jar. You can simply screw it on and it creates a little bit of a lift and it does create some stability. It's at least it's glass on metal. It's not as slippery as glass on glass. 
Then there's another trick. Let me see if I can do this one. Uh, a rubber band. Here's one. You can actually put a rubber band around there and create a little grippy. So it depends on, like sometimes I really like those produce rubber bands that you get, the, the wide, thick blue ones. Those work great. Um, and that just gives you a little bit like, it's like a stopper. Um, now, if you're doing this kind of thing with the clamp stand, you don't have to worry about this. I'm just giving you some options. Um, and this one, my bottle's a little small, so I might, this is a bigger rubber band. It might not be the ideal rubber band for what I'm doing. I'll put that there for a minute and see if I can do this. So you can play with it. I'm just giving you some ideas. Uh, everyone kind of figures out their own technique. I have watched dozens of herbalists do percolations and every single one of them has sort of figured out their own little tricks, you know? So um, mine's not the only way. Um, I've watched Thomas Easley do this. I've watched Lisa Gonora do this. I've watched, um, uh, what's her beautiful face? Mar Marie Noel Groves do this. Um, and, and they all make good medicine. That the bottom line is it's the medicine that matters. And then you find little things that work or don't work for you based on the equipment you have. Okay, so my little rubber band trick may or may not work because I don't know if I have the right size rubber band for the job. Let me see if I got one. Let me try one more. So what would happen if you decided to even speed it up more and you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna pack the herbs. I'm gonna put a little bit so that it's gonna digest and I don't have time, so I'm just gonna put the rest of the liquid and the next day I'll just set my thing and, and let it drip. Has, have you done something to impact the quality of the, the like the, the herb tincture? It comes out just fine. That's usually how I do my demos in class because I can't do my class over a two day period. So I squish it all into a three hour demo and every time the medicine comes out amazing. So I, I have not found a reason to say, no, don't ever do that or that you've limited the medicine. It's still really good medicine. Yeah. One other thing I'll share with you, these are actually kind of cool. Um, I, I used to buy from this company, um, bottle supply company that would always send me these, you know, the rubber grippy jar openers. They're super handy, by the way, they're cheap. Um, if you, the life of an herbalist is really, you're a jar opener. As my second calling in life, I am a professional jar opener. And people are often amazed, you know, I have big guys that come in and they're like, I can't open the jar. And I'm like, let me show you how to do It's not pressure, it's torque. You gotta get the torque right, okay? Anyway, so if you sometimes you get stuck and even your torque won't work or you have like a menstruum that's something sticky and the lid's just glued shut and you can't do it, this will help you open those jars. But it's also a rubber grippy and I have so many of them because I used to get a free one with every purchase that I did from this bottle company. Um, this makes a nice little slip stop too. So if you want it, if you have extras, you could cut a hole in the middle Put it on the top of your jar and you can set your perk on there and you, that thing ain't going anywhere it's like grip stop solid anchored in there so just giving you some other suggestions there okay um but my my you know what i am gonna cut a hole in this baby watch me do it right now i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it got like a dozen of these why not there you go. okay voila it'll still use work to open a jar Placing it there, look at that. She's solid, not going anywhere. In fact, I don't even need that stupid ring anymore. Make that go away. Bam. Okay. See? It's like MacGyver herbal medicine making. All right. <laughs> ah, here we go. So I'd like, I'd like to say I'd like to say something. Heather's uh, this is the ballpark Heather's in right now. Is um I, I watched over my career, uh, like most of clinical herbalism, as far as schools were gone, had died in North America by the 70s and 80s, right? There were uh, one or two schools here or there, but uh, most of the herbalists, they called it the herbal renaissance in the 70s and 80s, most of them were about plant walks and herbal, right? And medicine making, right? Uh, tincture making. And there's a, there's a certain thing, a bunch of our today's tincture companies started in that era. And it was kind of the hippie thing. Hey, man, there's a bunch of free stuff out there, right? I can go rip some of that up and I can put that on some alcohol. 
I can spend two dollars worth of materials and, and sell those for ten dollars an ounce. Wow, what a gig! And so a bunch of texture companies started that way. They were kind of like hippie, you know, hippie. Um, <laughs> they didn't want a job, so they went out and picked stuff in the woods and made tinctures. So I'm being a, a little bit sarcastic, but um, what happened was the focus. There weren't any clinics. There weren't any teaching clinics. There weren't really any herbal teaching clinics. To me, there was one in Canada, right? Uh, before 1990 or 1991, right? And uh, so for all that time, this is this my generation of herbalists, a lot of it was about tincture making. And then you got this thing, oh, look at this tincture. I made this super good tincture, right? And wow, taste this tincture. And boom, it knocks your head off. It's so good, right? And, there was, and then the companies got into this, the tincture companies in the 90s, we're selling tinctures to two stores, and they started saying, well, ours is double master rated, right? And there was this commercial competition to make these super, super strong tinctures, right? And so, let's say you go to all of that and you make this, I mean, wow, you take it, whoa, wow, that's a really nice strong tincture, okay. And then you got a patient, and you want a diaphoretic effect, or an amenagogue effect, or a sedative effect. What if you went to all that and you made that one super tincture and so you only need five drops instead of 10? The one where you need 10 works just fine, right? The thing you'll find in the herbal culture in North America, there's this thing, we want to make super tinctures, right? And commercially in the natural products industry, our tincture is better than their tincture. And I say, it's wonderful to get a tincture from Herb Firm. It's a very well-made tincture. I get some of my specialty tinctures from them. But you can take some herb and throw it in some alcohol and let it sit for three days, and you have a tincture that will do what you want it to do. Right? So I, I just, just encourage you, don't be... <laughs> I, I'll just tell one story. David Hoffman, famous British herbalist, it was in the 90s, he was visiting Boulder, and he was doing a book signing uh, at, a, at a natural food store. And the woman running the herb department there came out and was, oh, the famous David Hoffman and everything. He started showing them this one company was double macerating all their herbs and they had graphs showing the constituents in there and everything. And he looked at it and he, he, was, and he goes, that's bullshit. He goes, what? No, no, this is stronger and everything. He says, hey, wait a minute. I come from UK. I know the tinctures in UK are shit, <laughs> right? And they work. Yeah. <laughs> That's a world famous herbalist commenting on whether you need a fancy Cadillac tincture or whether you can make some medicine, make the medicine and use it. And do you know the cure for that is you get it is to taste your herbs. Yeah, exactly. You make your tincture, taste it. Does it have the effect you want it to have? That's a good tincture. Okay. There are some specialty things. It would be better to have your golden seal macerated, I mean, uh, percolated, because it's going to have different constituents in it. There are a few herbs like that, but for the most part, you don't have to be that fancy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely correct. Thank you, Paul. So, um, so then, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So then what about spagyrics? Um, like, are they bringing a different thing to the table? Spagyrics are not really what I consider traditional medicine that's dispensed by a clinical practitioner. Uh, they're sort of, it's a, a spin on alchemy. And what you what a spagyric is, is um, and there's different processes for making spagyrics, just like there's different processes for making tinctures. But there's the alchemy of where you create the four different elements out of the herb, and then you're combining the elements back together to make something that's uh, almost like supernatural. People are using them for beyond just clinical effects. They're using them for like psycho-spiritual effects. Um, and what I see is things like you burn, you burn the herb down to ash, which is called the salts of the herb. And then you basically are taking the salts and making that into a tincture. And I don't remember all the details, but they're supposed to be somehow like the four elements of, or, you know, it represented the in the old area. ancient spagyric was you ferment the herb uh -huh. and get the alcohol from that herb right right and, and then that's considered to be the soul of the herb right and then you distill it and you get the essential oil 
and that's the spirit of the herb. And then you burn the mark to ash and put the minerals back in there, and that's the body of the herb. This was the, the idea of it. Um, yeah. There's no reason to do that. The reason there's no reason to do that, there isn't enough minerals in there to actually do anything as far as nutrition goes. And you're going to take 20 drops of a tincture that has some minerals and you're not going to get your, your 300 milligrams of magnesium or your trace of anything in something that small. So the minerals don't, they won't have a positive clinical effect, right? And then you're going to get the volatile oils and the, the alcohol soluble things in a standard tincture. So as far as clinical effect, now this is, alchemy has its own thing, right? Because oh, you're doing this process, and the idea is you're also creating an inner transformation while you're doing the process, and by the time you've made your transformed thing, you yourself have been transformed, and then if you take that, that may have a different effect than et cetera like that. So, um, but as far as the first clinical, the spagyric, uh, a couple of, couple of companies do that. It, um, yeah. I, I think the spagyrics definitely feed into the popularity glam factor. Um, people want the cool, exotic, oh, it, like well, the way Paul was talking about tinctures being like, oh, well, my, I, my tincture company makes double macerated. I measure my consumer. My tincture is better than your tincture. Now it's like, well, I make spagyrics, which is better than all your tinctures. You know, it becomes this thing that's like, how useful is a spagyric when you're running a clinical practice? It's not, especially if there's an essential oil in there. Now you're running into danger territory. Uh, so I, yeah. I, I don't find them very useful. I think they're, they fall into the cool wow factor. I won't turn down a good spagyric when someone offers me one, but that's about it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they're distorted proportions. So somebody gave me a spagyric of Melissa, of lemon balm, mm -hmm. right? And it was very rich in lemon balm of essential oil. Right. Right, uh, much more than a simple tincture of the herb would have been. So there's a problem with them. You have standard doses of herbs, which might not apply exactly. to an herb that is rich with much more concentrated essential oil, right? Exactly. So, um, um, yeah, uh, the, the key, I'm telling you, the, the skill, the clinical skill is for you to take and taste the herbs. Uh, the herbs you're gonna use regularly, you wanna take them two or three days in a row and see what it's like when you take them like medicine two or three days in a row, feel what they do. This is how you're gonna know the humoral effects and the clinical effects. And this is, um, and then you have that, it's this inner library of personal experiences, right? That is there with you, you have reference to that when you're sitting with the patient. And then you know, oh, this one's sort of bitter, but it's bitter all afternoon. And this one's very bitter, but it passes away in two hours, right? You know, those things that you can't find in books, right? And uh, so uh, that's, uh, okay. <laughs> Enough said, I think. Thank you. But so that's, that's your skill. This is your grounded clinical skill. Take and taste the herbs um, and know what they take, know what the effects in your body are. And the ones you're going to use regularly, you want to take them for two or three days and feel what they're actually doing. And, and then you won't argue about, oh, this spagyric is better than that, it's better than that. Yeah. This is what we did when we did the, uh, in NAIMH, we did maceration and percolation, right? And then we had 10 or 20 people sample them <laughs> and decide which one was better. See, that was the proof. We're going to say, oh, the maceration is better than the percolation, the percolation is better. No, we had 10 or 20 people sample them. And we had some surprises. Some things were better than we didn't think they would be. Right? And, but that's the test and the proving. Uh, and and uh, we hope that's your foundation in this, in this program. And in all our clinical program, our dietary changes, you make the dietary change, see what it does. I love all the comments coming in the chat box, the clinical egoticians. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Nicole, you're brilliant. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just show you the drip part. Okay. We've got everything ready, but the drip rate's the last piece and we'll get this set up and then we'll sort of check on it um, after we take our break and periodically to see if our drip rate stays the same. Because that is another thing that can sort of change um, once you start a drip rate, sometimes it doesn't maintain that drip rate. So you'll have to check out it periodically. Um, so, but here I am, I've got my lid tight, right? It's been digesting. 
And now I'm going to go ahead and I'll just place that down there. Uh, pour, I'm gonna pour my solution to the top or as much as it'll hold. I don't necessarily have to pour in all my solution at once, um, but you can if you have a big enough cylinder. I, I like to make sure it doesn't get too close to the top just in case it starts to wobble, then I'm not worried about sloshing. So I might stop there for right now. It's about halfway up my cylinder. So when I pick it up, I'm not gonna make huge spills. I do see little bubbles coming to the top, like it's filling in little air pockets. So I might wait for those bubbles to do their thing. Cause anytime you see bubbles coming in, that means there's air pockets. So I want everything to be fully saturated, no air pockets before I get my drip rate going. So I'm see, I got some bubbles. I'm gonna wait for those to go away. In fact, I might help it and get a spoon in there. Now you don't wanna disturb the surface of your pack, but I can just like, um, I'm moving the paper is all. The paper has like, there's like air pockets between the paper and the herb. So that's all I'm doing right now. Not No poking. And that's very, very important with a, because the pack is so critical, you don't wanna start poking in there. Do not mess with your pack. Um, Looks like I've released all the air bubbles. It was just a little bit of air trapped between the paper and the herb, and that has now all gone away. Stop bubbling. Okay, it's all gone away. And now I am going to adjust the drip rate. So now I'm gonna use my screw top. It'd be nice if I wasn't wearing black shirt, because then you could see the contrast of the black cap. But um, here it is. I'm going to just gently Actually, this is kind of cool. Let me show you. This is the vacuum thing we've been talking about. I don't know if you can see this, but there's the liquid is, there's so much liquid in here. You can see all that, but there is no liquid. It has not come to the lid yet because the, the airflow has been stopped. So it's a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, once the second I open that lid, this neck is gonna fill with liquid and there's currently air in there. There is no, you can't really tell, but there is no liquid in that neck so just to show you the the vacuum phenomenon that happens now i am going to carefully uh, there is a little bit of liquid that came out earlier and is settled on the lid so at first this is what always happens you first start to twist the lid and you get like a puddle and you gotta kind of like open up open up your cap you could actually even like take your cap off for a second now put it back on and you're gonna play with the screw to get a drip. Oh, I got another cap right here. I'll just leave that one in there for now. Okay. So yeah, you're gonna play with your cap till you get a drip that comes out between one, one drop per three seconds, roughly. Three to five, I've heard. Like, it can be up to five not even a second, it's the count of three, right? It's a waltz. It's one, two, three, one, two, three. And you want your drip to come out on the one. I will tell you, I already smell the salicylates pouring out. I can smell the meadow sweet with this. And it's, it's not even like I've done anything like the right amount of time. Um, and I'm gonna wait for the drips, cause that it's, at first it's a little messy and then you kind of play with it till you get it just right. So I'm watching my drips. One, two, three, one, two. It's like coming out at the count of every three. So right now it's, I want to come out on the first beat, not all three beats. I'm gonna tighten my lid Mother? just to here. Yes. Do you, so are you just using a regular screw cap to do this or do you have the, the fancy one that's in the other one? Just the cap that's on here. I'm you just adjusting the screw to use. Okay, the, so you're using the cap as your valve for this kind of so it's the liquid like coming up out of the cap and then pouring over exactly I just can't see it. i'm just trying i'm to gonna see get it. it closer to you so you can see in fact i'm gonna do that right now and just move this so it's less messy and it's hard to see because i'm at a distance and i can't bring the camera to me i can move around here one two three it's kind of like one every two the count of two right now do you see the drips and it is coming up over the cap just using the cap totally cheater it works just fine okay this is this is literally how michael moore taught people to make calculations for decades 
And then people start getting fancy and using lab glass things. And there are, you can get fancy. And like I said, then you can do the wine bottle and get the needle valve. Um, you know, you have to go find the needle valve. That's a thing. Then you have to find a silicone stopcock. So those are easier things than said than done when you can simply just use what you got. So this is like, you know, one fourth, this is four, four time right now. I got to adjust this to like one, three time. So let me adjust. So you're just going to keep playing. You're going to tweak it. You just got to tweak that little valve until you get some airflow, but not too fast. And like I said, I mean, this is, do you see the color of what come out so far? I'm just letting you know, this is perfectly fine medicine right here, right now. Okay. And, and so what happens with the drip is you'll get it really close and then you'll stand back and just look to see where it settles because it will kind of alter once you set it down and stand back. So right now I go one, two, one. So it's got like right now it's a one, two. One, two, and it's, doesn't, it's not rocket science, right? The drip rate just controls how fast it goes through. I've heard some herbalists say, listen to your heartbeat and adjust the drip rate to measure the rhythm of your heart. I mean, you can get as you know funny and out there as you want with it. Um, it's like I said, it's not rocket science, but what's happening is it is slowing down slightly as I sit and just watch. It's just slightly slowing down. And it's actually about settling at one, two, three right now. So I'll show you what I've got. It could go a little tiny bit slower, but let's see if you can see. I don't know if you can see. I don't know if you can see. I have to, might lift it up there. Mm, yeah, one, two, three. It's waltzing. It's doing the waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. It's the percolation walls. That's yeah. it. Making music. Okay. So this will take a while. I'm literally, what I will do um, uh, is walk away and I check on it. Now you can just, I, I, I could finish pouring my solution in at this point. Now that I've adjusted the valve, I can go ahead and fill it up pour the rest of my solution. And I could walk away and I could let this run overnight. Um, the one thing is I do like to check periodically because sometimes it's weird. Like it'll run for two hours and you come back and check on it and it just stops. So you might have to, after a couple hours, like readjust your valve. Um, and it's might just because like the suction got funny, but that's it. It's running. It's doing its thing. Um, I might try to get in there and fish out the cap that I dropped in the bottom, but that is percolation. Not hard. Just got to know a few little tips, right? And you can see the quality. Of this is amazing. I can already smell the methyl salicylates very strongly. I mean, it smells sweet and delicious. I can tell you that even though I did everything wrong as far as timing to standard percolations, this is going to be stronger than a standard maceration. Yeah. Cool, huh? Would you want to cover it since it's going to sit out? Do you put like another coffee filter on top just to like keep anything from, I don't know. You need the airflow. Like you, you, no. no, you just have to be careful to leave it and everybody. I do have that one paper barrier between the herb and the liquid where I poured. But if I put anything on top of this, I'm stopping suction, right? We need the drawdown suction. So you just leave it open. You don't want to put anything on top. You need that airflow. So yeah, just make sure you don't set it like underneath tree with falling leaves and debris or something or your cat, put it somewhere where your cat's not gonna knock it over. These are all little things that you wanna consider. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I love doing percolations outside. I'll set them up sometimes on my front porch and like let the sunlight hit it and things like that, which I think are wonderful and the fresh air flowing. Um, yeah, yep, just leave it and, um, and hope for the best. Because right now it's making really good medicine.
And I'll just do for this camera over here so that camera can see the percolation comes out nice and dark. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna take a little break and we can schedule uh, 10 minutes. Any questions before you guys, before I let you go? We'll come back and do some more fun stuff. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's see here. I've got 1140, we'll call it the 40, 40, oh, 41. Uh, 41 mark, come back at the 51 mark. We'll take a 10 minute break. Okay, I'll see y'all in a few. Recording stop.